Hello, everybody. Welcome to Epistemic, episode number seven. Today is Thursday, December 14th, Star Wars episode eight day. I've got my tickets. So I hope you guys do. And uh, today we have guests, uh, Cam Spears and Raul Cardona. Uh, we also we have Anthony Magnabosco. Hey, Anthony, how's it going? Hey, guys. What's up? Nice to see you. So, Cam, want to give a quick intro? Sure. So I'm Cam Spires. Um, I've had an interest in street epistemology for quite a while, primarily um, because I like the idea of having better conversations with people and found that typically the debate style technique didn't really work out at getting to what really matters. Um, I have a bit of a background in epistemology, not um, academically trained, but more strong interest and passion for it. And yeah, that's about me. Awesome. Uh, all right, Raul, I uh, want to give a quick intro as well. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Raul Cardona. Um, I've been doing street epistemology, actively going out now for the it's probably since May of this year. Um, as a Christian, I used to actually do one-on-one -on -one street evangelism. So it's always been the kind of thing that I've been drawn to. I love these type of conversations. So and actually have background as a Christian and presuppositional apologetics even. So um, maybe we'll get into some of that as well, but it's great to be here. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Welcome. Cool. This is awesome. I didn't realize you had that background. That's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So first, uh, let me just give a quick overview of our episode today. Um, recap what happened since the last show. And then Cam is going to get into how we how we can uh, maybe address some presuppositional apolog apologetics and then we'll meet Raul a little bit better and he'll uh, talk about his background and how he got into SE and then we'll do a video breakdown of one of Raul's videos. We'll try to get into this uh, criticism that SE is av avoiding facts. So that should be fun. And then after, after that, we'll do listener questions and then do some announcements. Um, but I guess first up, uh, a quick recap since the last show. Went to a film festival in Austin, Texas uh, last weekend, which uh, gave me the opportunity to visit the Atheist Experience uh, studio in person. That was a lot of fun. Matt Tillahati was scheduled to be uh, back as host uh, for the first time in a, in a while, but uh, he was apparently under the weather and couldn't make it. So uh, I think um, uh, Russell, Russell, uh, yeah, um, yeah, filled in. So that was fine That's as well. That's cool. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. What have you been up to, Anthony? Well, I went out and did a few uh, a few recordings with people this past week. The weather turned really nice, so I went out and had a few chats with people. Um, one or two that might be YouTube worthy. I don't know. I might try to go out tomorrow and do some more. Um, there was enough to do a couple just like little short clips, like a, a little quick clip here or there. Um, but nothing too, nothing too, um, you know, interesting, I guess. So I was working on that. Uh, and I was also on a couple podcasts recently that I just wanted to mention. I was on the Science Enthusiast podcast last night, and that was a cool interview. And then uh, earlier in the week, um, Robert Stanley with the Right to Reason podcast uh, released an interview with me where we actually went through some of those quick clip videos and broke them down. So he would we would talk about it, I'd set it up, we'd play it, and then we'd, we'd break down the video as far as what the takeaway message was with the conversation. So those those two are out now if you want to look those up. That's about it. Kind yeah, of getting ready for the holidays. You know, kind of shifting gears, focusing more on the family right now, and I think I'll probably hit it really hard again in january sweet awesome and i saw it was getting a little bit colder uh you're like wearing a jacket in one of your last videos you mentioned that so yeah i had some long sleeves going on and we had some snow the, uh, last week too which is really unusual for san antonio uh, so yeah i got in like the 50s cold. yeah i got in like the 50s here in la but now it's back to like 80 degrees so it's, it's good good with me uh to our next segment uh, if in case anybody else has anything to recap anybody no okay all right let's move on to uh cam uh suppositional apologetics yeah welcome to the show cam i think i've seen you before maybe with with doug a couple of times 
And yeah, I've been, I, um, I know we've chatted many, many times, but I don't think I've ever met you on camera before. So it's really nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Um, yeah, I've appeared on uh, Doug's uh, Pine Creek channel a few times, but um, yeah. So what I want to get into today is a bit of an overview of uh, presuppositionalism. Um, fortunately, we have an expert here, and Raul, I didn't actually realize you have a background, um, so feel free to interject and correct me if I get things wrong. But I want to give a broad overview and um, give some comments on uh, how I see it um, fitting in with SE or relating to SE and how um, a street epistemologist might approach a conversation with somebody who is um, putting forward some kind of presuppositionalism. So I would characterize um, two like broad characteristics of presuppositionalism. One is um, a, as a worldview um, based on theism and the Bible. But then the other side of it is that it's a dialectical method, like it's a, um, an apologetical method used in conversation with non-believers. Um, primarily to either challenge them or shut them down or to get them to change their mind potentially. Um, so there are um, non-Christian presuppositionalists, but commonly the people you will, you will encounter are, um, are of the Christian variety. And that's partly because of the origins of presuppositionalism presuppositionalism actually came out of um, a couple of Christian figures. Um, so what is presuppositionalism? Generally, it's a, um, it's a, a claim that um, foundational concepts and human experiences, such as logic, uh, rational thought, morality, um, and an expectation that the future will resemble the past, can only be derived and accounted for by Christian theism. And this kind of tends to take two different forms. Either the presuppositionalist um, assumes um, that the Bible is a supernatural revelation of God, or they take the Bible as axiomatic, kind of like how um, how we take uh, axioms and mathematics um, as axiomatic. And so some more about the relevance to SE. Um, you, if you've been practicing SE among, especially like Facebook groups or in Google Hangouts and stuff like that, you will have probably encountered people espousing presuppositionalism. And it can be quite challenging to deal with because they will immediately put you on the back foot. Um, so uh, how do you typically recognize it? Um, it? There are two really central claims that get made. They make the claim that us as non-Christians uh, borrow from a Christian's worldview in order to um, have intelligibility or to make any kind of argument or even just to um, understand the world at all. Um, and then they also make a separate claim, which is that all non-Christian worldviews are incoherent, um, absurd or inconsistent. Um, and they will often ask you to account for things like the laws of logic, um, morality, and yeah, that type of stuff. Yeah, I just think I've seen that a lot where if you're unable to adequately give an answer, they take that as lending credence to their argument, where they're not so much making an argument other than assuming that this thing is true. The fact that you might struggle answering a question, they seem to take that as a justification for their assertions. Yes, and they will try to encourage you to provide a um, full account of your entire worldview um, in order to just even have common ground with them. Um, you must um, give a, a, an account which allows you to be certain of the things that you believe. 
So um, what about it might be unique uh, for SE, for street epistemology? Um, I think it's probably the most severe form of uh, belief or dos doxastic closure that you will encounter. Um, the, the level of certainty um, that I have noticed among presuppositionalists is probably the highest I've encountered um, anywhere. Um, they use a lot of philosophical jargon or philosophical terminology, which um, can really throw a street epistemologist off if they don't understand all of that. Um, our usual method is, of course, to ask, the, ask questions about um, that to arrive at their beliefs. Uh, but commonly, presuppositionalists will avoid answering such questions, attempt to control the conversation themselves, um, in particular by making a demand that you must provide um, an alternate account to all of these fundamental things before we can even proceed to have a rational conversation. Um, so how might you respond to this as an SE? Like how can you tailor your questions? Um, to be perfectly honest, and this might be a really negative assessment, I don't think that you're gonna have much success with somebody who's espousing presuppositionalist views. Um, I mean, I would really like to ho hope that you will, but I, th I think you should expect a lot of difficulty in making progress. Um, so definitely don't enter into the discussion with um, an expectation that you'll change the person's mind um, or you'll get them to genuinely reflect on why they believe what they do. Um, but if I was to encourage particular types of questions to ask, I would say, um, ask them about how they originally arrived at their form of theism or their belief that the Bible is true. Ask them about how they determined the Bible is a revelation of God. Um, ask them that common essay question of whether or not they could observe any kind of evidence that would make them change their mind or doubt. Um, Try to focus in on their need for certainty. Um, I would say that one of the biggest characteristics of presuppositionalists is that they have a just a burning desire for certainty in their worldview. And I think that that is at the heart of why they go towards what I see as um, an attempt for an intellectually satisfying reason that removes their doubt and satisfies their emotional need for certainty. Um, the outsider test of faith is obviously a common thing to go to as an essayist. Um, I suspect it probably won't work. Most presuppositionalists are actually quite well informed about why other worldviews are wrong or inconsistent. And if you try to point to other religious believers um, from other faith traditions as something that should uh, cause them to doubt the reliability of the methods they've used to determine Christian theism is true, they will proceed to list off reasons why those beliefs are wrong. For example, you know, pointing out a contradiction in the Quran or pointing out, um, you know, some non-divine origins of the Bhagavad Gita or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's that's my overview. Awesome. Thanks, Cam. Um, if I could, I need, I need to add something real quick there. Like, yeah, the, the argument from the precept is difficult to begin with. Um, and then I think it's complicated by their their confidence in their argument at least the examples that i've seen tend to come across as arrogance and um i can feel myself getting like ramped up and getting agitated when they're hitting me with question after question and they're being so condescending and and cocky when they're engaging when i see engagements or if i'm engaging with them and that you know that in itself is a barrier to to helping until breaking through because 
you just want to like you know grab their neck and just shake them so so um it's definitely at least the examples that i've seen a lot of people say well why how is se any different than the presuppositionalists who just keep saying how do you know how do you know how do you know and one of the big examples i think is that when you see an se conversation it seems more like a partnership it's not just let me hit you with all these questions to confuse you no let's slow down and really understand it i've yet to see a presuppositionalist say well how do you account for your world worldview can you take me through it and it's a it's a lot more brash and and abrupt and i do recognize that maybe the examples that i've seen are not a good representation of the presup argument maybe there's a better example than the ones that i've seen um, but that's just been my perspective so far on it yeah so there's two broad camps i guess i mean there are more than that but two main ones um one this from this guy cornelius van till and another um from a guy named uh, gordon clark and they um have spawned um you know followers of 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 that method um so there are differences among them and actually sometimes there's quite a lot of disagreement um between each of the methods that they use and criticism of so don't expect that all people um that you encounter who espouse a form of presuppositionalism don't expect that they um, will be the same um, but there are common elements and mm. i think that um yeah emphasizing that need for certainty is probably the biggest one yeah and i think you mentioned it earlier like using an outsider test for faith with a presup is like walking into a buzzsaw it's just not going to work they've already figured out how to weasel around that one uh, and maybe the best approach is to get into the distinctions between other precepts you know we have a precept over here who says this and you're saying this how can we tell who's who's more correct and i'm wondering i'm actually wondering um how how Raoul um, addressed the pre. I mean, he was a big proponent of presuppositionalists. It sounds like, and I'm really curious to see to see. Uh, yeah, to hear your uh, side of this. Like, how did you how did you come to grips with it? Yeah, tell yep. us a little bit maybe about your journey on that. Well, um, so I, I held to presuppositional apologetics for a while as a Christian, and the draw of it is that actually it it's kind of, it's kind of analogous to street epistemology in the atheist community where you have something that, like as an atheist, I don't have to know all the arguments defending an atheistic or naturalistic worldview. I can just focus on the methodology that the other person uses and try to identify um, the how of their questions. And like, that's kind of the draw of uh, presuppositional apologetics is that you don't have to be an evidentialist like um, Josh McDowell or William Lane Craig, where you have all these facts built up in your head. You can, um, just simply be aware of the presuppositions of the of the other person of the atheist or whoever and and by simply by asking the right questions you can uncover um the lack of a foundation that the the non-christian has so that's kind of the draw of it is it's a it doesn't require expert knowledge so it, it has a certain appeal um to people for that reason but as a as an atheist now what i found to be the best approach is to become when you're talking with presuppositionalists is to become a presuppositionalist yourself and to first and foremost identify what presuppositions the presuppositionalist is making and ask them about that in just typical se fashion ask them about how they know what they know because their epistemology is essentially and they're kind of unashamed about this it's kind of um admittedly like their epistemology is to simply presuppose certain things as true and as long as they can demonstrate that it's cohesive like it, that it has an internal um, consistency then the presupposition they would say is valid um but my thing is when i'm talking to a presuppositionalist i want to question them about the validity of their presuppositions and i don't want them to just simply assert that something's true so if they say god exists I'm going to focus on that if they say um, they have a reliable foundation for logic i'm going to ask them about that if they say that it was just whatever claim they make i want to identify whatever that claim is and ask them about how they came to that conclusion and if their answer is something to the effect of 
well, I just assume it like we assume, like we assume other things such as logic, then I'm going to ask, okay, let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about what, what kind of, what, what do we require of something like logic before we accept it as a foundational truth? And does I see, I, I see this thing all the time where they're like, it was revealed to me through scripture. And we, ex I've seen examples where we just like, we accept that like, okay. And then we, we go down this path of how can we know anything or can we trust our senses? And I think we need to spend more time on how they determined that it was revealed to them. Was it a decision that they made with their brain or was there something in the book that they felt compelling? Like, I think more time should be spent there. Um, when they make that yeah, so about it being revealed. I agree. I think that that's a fantastic uh, thing to focus on. And I mentioned it earlier. They do have a common way of responding to that, which is to say, I didn't determine um, that it was true using my own reasoning. It was revealed to me that it was true by God. And so it's kind of this, uh, if you're familiar with the term in epistemology called externalism, um, they actually usually demand you as a non-believer to give a form of internalist account of your epistemology, but then themselves ultimately use what's called an externalist form of epistemology where they are relying on God having actually revealed to them this thing in a way that they can't be um, wrong. So yeah, they, they have a response, but whether or not it's satisfying is another story. Yeah. Do we have t t time to keep going on this segment? Because I have one more thing I wanted to talk about, like with the precept thing, if we have sure. time. I think we just had 15 minutes carved out for this, but um, I've mentioned this before, and I think you may have even mentioned it, Cam, as uh, um, I know Doug has covered this too, but talking about how they first stumbled across this this defense of the faith. What did they find compelling about it? What were they doing before they found this belief, this this approach of presuppositionalism? Where were they in terms of their confidence? Were they lower in terms of their confidence and then they increased their confidence when they discovered this argument? Um, what do they plan on teaching their kids? If they have a seven-year-old kid who has no clue about presuppositionalism, are they gonna teach the kid that they're gonna presuppose that this book is true or just wait for this to be revealed to you like it was revealed to me and get into the mechanics of how they expect other people who have no exposure to this concept of presupposing as a reliable way to conclude that something is true try to get into the mechanics of how they anticipate other people who have never been exposed to it before might react to it yeah that's i think that's a great question asking about the origin of of their belief in the apologetical method, but also in how they arrived at Christian theism originally. Um, one thing is that presuppositionalists do tend to be Calvinists. And so they really think that there's nothing that you can do as an individual to like arrive at uh, Christian theism. Um, instead that it's all via the, you know, the actions of, of the God. Um, but yeah, Raul, you made a really good point before about how um, as an apologetical method, it alleviates your need to have this comprehensive expert knowledge of the evidence in question, the evidence of the Bible or geology or, you know, cosmology or all of these different things. You can kind of just leave that aside and stick with the fact that the revelation is true and that you can't be wrong that it's true. And that's the foundation. Yeah, I think it's really telling too when somebody just says, I believe, or I know that it's true because I've just presupposed that it's true. It's such a weak argument. And I, I, I'm baffled that it gets so much traction and that we find ourselves spending a lot of time discussing it like here, because it seems like such a weak, laughable argument. And you would think that if you had evidence, you would just provide the evidence. If you, if there was something compelling in your book, you would, you would bring that out and show that to people rather than construct so, this, this thing. 
So I, I do tend to agree with you, but to play devil's advocate, Anthony, you're saying that Please. within you're saying that within the assumptions of my worldview as a Christian. So in order for you to be able to make such an objection, you actually have to already assume that the Christian God exists. And that's part of the problem is that, <laughs> and, you know, obviously I'm, I'm role playing, but it, it's, I totally agree, but yeah, they just have this tactic that immediately changes the, um, you know, the epistemic position that you thought you were coming from, which is one of actually having common ground with one another, where as, you know, moderately rational human beings, we can actually engage in conversation and engage in question. All of that, I think, has its, you know, it's like a rug being pulled from under you. Um, and you're put in a position where there isn't actually any common ground. You've just assumed that you have common ground, whereas you're really actually assuming my worldview. Right. Yeah, I think what would be really um, useful is to have more people like Raul who used to believe in that, used to you know, readily, readily go with that argument, and they found it very compelling and, and comforting and easy. And then they eventually came around to discarding it. Like we, we need more people who used to go with that argument and then figure out, figure out their thought process, what enticed them in the first place. And then what eventually led them to abandoning that argument and seeing it for a poor argument. Yeah. I find presuppositionalism as like the clearest example of how ideologies are not always held for, you know, reasonable reasons. Like, our so, some ideologies are just just uh, rationalizations to try to allow us to meet our own like psychological and social needs. And I think I think if I came across if someone if a presuppositionalist sat down at my table and we got to that at this at this just kind of like stalemate situation where they just presuppose figure out what that belief was doing for the person like psychologically like what is it how is it helping them in their life like if they didn't believe like uh the next day what would be missing i think you would get into things like death very quickly and or an afterlife or and some way to sense of how morality works so i think that those types of things are driving these strategic reasons to like just come up with reasons like uh, presuppositionalism. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I know that some people have a a real aversion to that kind of analysis um, because it feels like it's making it about the person. And but I do think that emotional and psychological needs are really at the heart of um, why people choose this tactic. Um, and I do think it's it's a good idea to focus on that as soon as you find somebody is just simply presupposing their worldview is true. Right. Cool. Well, I think we've covered a bit there. Um, if anything else, uh, I'd like to move on to the next next part. Um, so, Raul, um, want to tell us a little about your YouTube channel, like how you got involved in SE? So yeah, definitely. Um, so, I became a non-theist i don't know maybe a couple years ago but as soon as i started listening to the kind of street epistemology videos that like you and and anthony do it, it just immediately uh appealed to me because like i said as a christian i had a background in in street evangelism and i used to love that stuff i used to love going out and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations about what people believed and politely challenging them and so forth so it's always been something that i've been drawn to um, and so, um, I decided to, to try to try to go out and try to vi uh, video record these like you guys do, um, just as a way to, um, just take a part in the conversation, add to it. Um, and so I've been doing that now since about May of this year, started going out, uh, I live in Pensacola, Florida. I found a great place, um, that I go here locally. It's a, a college campus, one of the best places to go young people who are just eager to learn. They love knowledge. 
Um, they're still in their formative years. They love to talk. It's a college campus, so people are just hanging out. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm I love it. I'm enjoying it. I've benefited from from much of the material that's already out there, and I just want to like continue continue that legacy. That's cool. Have you read Peter's book? I have. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. Okay, because I've I've heard of some people just going out and trying this, and they've never even read the book, or they join the the Facebook group, and then they discover that there's a book. You know, it's kind of interesting that it didn't start that way. Um, what would you say is was your biggest roadblock to going out? I know that you used to do it before. Was it easier to go out as somebody asking SE related questions as opposed to proselytizing, or was it the same? Or hmm. I would say there's probably less pressure just because with street evangelism, you you don't have that like that positive belief that you're trying to get somebody to adopt. Like I don't like I, uh, it's not like I'm getting somebody to doubt their beliefs so that I can sell them something else. So there's less pressure, you know, I'm going there and I'm having an honest discussion. Um, and I just want to hear where they're coming from and put their beliefs politely to the test. Um, and just, and just have a conversation, you know, but I'm not selling anything. Yeah. I could, I could think of people who might see, you know, someone who's doing street evangelism, going to street epistemology and seeing like, just, you're just switching religions or switching tribes. Like, is there like in your mind, a, a, a fundamental difference between street evangelism and street epistemology? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, some of it is that like, um, as, as, um, as at least speaking of my presuppositional background, like a lot of that has to do with a really suspicious, uh, assumption um, towards the other person that this person's a non-Christian and they deny the truth. They know the truth, but inwardly they're rebelling against it. Um, they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Um, they know the truth. They just won't accept it. And as a, as an atheist, as a humanist, my assumptions for talking with a fellow human being who just happens to hold different beliefs is entirely different because I realize that this person is just another human being who's searching for meaning who wants to have things like purpose and they could be mistaken for a myriad of reasons. And I just want to talk to them about that. And if at the end of the day, they end up not getting things right and their beliefs are still what I believe to be wrong. It's not a big deal because I still see them as a fellow human. Awesome. Nice. Cool. Well, uh, want to move on to the breakdown of the video? Sure. Awesome. I got that queued up here. Um, I wanted to ask you though, um, about the differences, uh, it almost seemed like when you were, what you were just describing that you were, had maybe more of a hostile attitude towards non-believers um, when you were going out as a Christian than you do today. Is were you saying that, or I don't want to put words in your mouth? Yeah, I mean, so, somewhat like, um, yeah, for, just coming from a Calvinist presuppositional background. Um, I mean, that may have not always come out as like a Westboro Baptist type of street evangelist where you're like screaming at people, waving your Bible at them and stuff like that. Yeah. But that is kind of the assumption, yeah. you know, that this, this person is, is fundamentally your enemy kind of. Yeah. Did you ever put the pressure on yourself? Like I have, to, I, yeah, I'm kind of wondering about your motivation. Like I, when I, I've talked to a lot of street preachers and it seems like they take it upon themselves that there's this burden that I have to put on myself to change the world and save these people from hell. And I would imagine that that would be a pretty stressful thing. Did, did, that ever, did that ever cross your mind? Was that a component for you? Well, that's, that's the upside of being a Calvinist is you don't have to worry about that because it's not up to you. You know, you're, you're just, mm -hmm. you're, you're just an instrument in the sovereign uh, God's hands and it's up to him who he saves ultimately. And he's just calling you to be a faithful witness, but, okay. but there's no yeah. pressure. And that leads that begs the question then well why the hell do you go out and go out there and talk to people anyways if it's all pre-planned mm -hmm. that's so annoying okay <laughs> all right you want to show uh, you want to set up this video role looks like you're yeah sure so this was a um, recent interview i had with um a, a girl that i met on the college campus where i go to locally and her name is taryn and um, I think she was, uh, I'm guessing she was um, like a, so a sophomore, or maybe freshman, but she was a pretty young, young lady. And she came from a pretty religious background, she said. 
it sounded like she came from a pretty fundamentalist type background. And um, I don't know that she really had thought about this, like her beliefs a lot before. And that kind of comes out in her interview. So it was really interesting to talk to her about that. Okay, so here we go. To witness the strength. Two seconds. I think Anthony. Meter so I'm walking around Sorry. campus, Taryn, and I'm asking people to identify some Sorry belief you hold to. It could be anything at all. Um, I would. I was hoping for you to identify that belief, and then I would like to interview you and just ask you questions related to how you uh, arrived at that conclusion, how you came to hold whatever that belief is. And so, it could it could be up to you. Um, I like I like preferably for you to choose whatever belief it is. It could be um, anything at all. Some categories, some examples. It could be. Uh, religious, it could be non-religious, it could be um, spiritual, it can be paranormal, it could be political, it can be um, just anything at all. Just some belief that you're fairly certain of and that serves as somewhat of a foundation for you as far as your, your thinking about the world, your view of the world, your understanding of reality. So do, do you want to pick something and, and, and I can, um, we can, we can focus on that? Thank you. Okay. Well, I believe, that, well, this is kind of a religious thing. I believe okay. that Jesus is my savior. That's just a thing that I've always had and that he will guard and defend all of his uh, children along with, yeah. Okay. So Jesus is my savior. Maybe we can work with that. Mm -hmm. um, so why do you, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that, that Jesus, that, um, this 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 particular thing about Jesus, because when I was growing up, that's what I was taught. Because I'm from a fairly religious town uh, of the Panhandle, and all we did pretty much all that there was was churches all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, what could you do on Saturday and Sunday? Go to church. Okay. <laughs> so that's just how I was taught. My parents are fairly religious even though they come from two different types and denominations of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I just always thought that Jesus was my savior. Okay. Okay. So um, you believe this because you were taught it growing up. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know this to be true? Um, so that, so you were, you believe it because it's something that you were taught growing up. Mm -hmm. You were just raised to believe it, but how do you know that this thing that you believe in is, is true? Because Jesus, as a person to say, he always, uh, he always performs miracles. And when people pray to him, he always performs. Like, for example, my mom, she had surgery on Tuesday. We prayed that she would have a speedy recovery. And we thought for like the first week, she wouldn't be able to eat anything because it was like in this area. But... One day after, she just started, like, the day right after her uh, surgery, she started eating. She didn't have to have an incubation tube anymore. She didn't have to have a breathing tube. She could do everything on her own. And Jesus just performed that miracle because we all prayed to him, and he gave my family the strength. Okay. All right, so maybe we can work with this example to, to maybe focus it a little bit. So you're saying you believe um, Jesus is your Savior because... He performs miracles like when you pray concerning your mom's surgery, she recovers from the surgery sooner than expected. Mm -hmm. One day after she's, she's eating, even though you, you didn't expect that. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what is it about this event that causes you to attribute it to, to God or, or to Jesus? What makes you, uh, what about this makes you think this, this is God? Can you pause or, it there? So um, that's one that's one question that I've learned to ask with people is a lot of times the, they'll give a reason for their belief and they'll they'll just kind of assume that the implication is obvious that that this obviously proves that what I believe is true and so I've learned to go beyond that and ask you know for for the why behind it why what is it about that specifically that you think necessitates the conclusion the conclusion you've arrived at. 
Yeah, this is called the, what is it? Proctor Hawk, after this, therefore, because of this type of fallacy. So people just attributing the god to whatever without. Uh, I'm going to just win in the location. I think it's a great spot. A... Looks nice and quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay, playing now. Okay. Well, like I said, we're, I'm from a fairly religious town, and we always say, hey, please pray for us. And as soon as we, a bunch of people are like, oh, we're going to pray for you. It happens in our favor. Like, mm -hmm. if we just don't say anything about it, it usually falls unfavorable to us because I'm not going to lie, I have a really unlucky family. Okay. So whenever God is at work, we seem to have a fairly easy life. Okay. Okay, so you, you feel like you've seen consistently prayer work. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, like, I like to get an idea in these kind of conversations as, as I'm asking you questions related to how you arrived at this conclusion. I like to get a sense of um, what would convince you otherwise. What, 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 would, what would convince you that um, you were wrong concerning this, this belief? Well, to prove me wrong that Jesus is not my savior, it would have to be something of the fact that I die and I just, I see someone and they're like, I'm not Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about mm -hmm. because I'm just going to believe that until I hit the dirt. Like, mm -hmm. I always thought that because it's a wide belief. Okay. Um, what about the whole prayer issue, the miracles and stuff? What if, let's say theoretically, um, in, in regards to the situation with your mom's surgery, what if you looked into it and it turned out that this kind of speedy recovery is actually not that uncommon. Um, it's, maybe it's not like the majority of people who have these surgeries, but let's say, let's say theoretically you looked into it and it turned out that actually, let's say a certain percentage of people do have kind of a you know, quicker recovery than other people and that it's actually quite common. Would that convince you that this was not due to, um, to God? No, I'm not one to like, push away my beliefs just because of one thing and plus they are lucky to even have a speedy recovery as well mm -hmm. because a majority of the people it takes them around a week to be able to grow the strength and the motivation to even chew mm -hmm. and stuff like that so it's more of a miracle to me because not many people can uh do you mind pausing there for a minute so what what, what i was trying to do there is peel back the onion and so she gave a reason, the reason she gave for her belief was that her mom had a, a speedy recovery from her surgery. And so I wanted to peel back that layer and see what remained. And so I asked her, okay, what if, what if that wasn't a, a piece of evidence? What if that piece of evidence were to be explained away somehow and to see where that brought the conversation? Strength. And of course, the strength comes from somewhere, and I just believe the strength came from Jesus. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to make sure I understand you. So, if if you found evidence that this was not that uncommon, you saying it wouldn't it wouldn't waver you concerning your belief? Yeah, it would not. Okay. What if? Let me try to think of another example. Let's say, let's say you you guys prayed for this, and it turns out she didn't have a speedy recovery. Let's let's say you guys prayed for it, and she had the same the same length of recovery as everyone else or maybe even prolonged length recovery would that cause you to your confidence in this belief to decrease at all no it would not because like i said i don't deter from my uh belief and uh with god uh he works in mysterious ways mm -hmm. so he may have a path for you that you don't foresee and something happens and that'll just make your uh He's testing you on your strength mm -hmm. because that's what God does. He always tests you on your strength to make sure, but he doesn't push you over the edge because he's not like that. Mm -hmm. okay. He just wants to make sure that you are a strong believer and that even if he makes you question your ways, he does not deter your faith. Okay. Hmm. What if, um, what if you met somebody from a different religion who gave a similar reason for why they believe in what they believe in. Let's say, let's say you, you, you met a Muslim and you, you're interested in knowing why he believes that Allah is God, why Muhammad is his prophet. And he, and he says, well, I believe that because 
you know, I, I've seen prayer work. We we prayed for my my father or my uncle or my my mom, and um, <clears throat> and he actually had a great outcome. He recovered quickly. Um, would you take that as proof of uh, his claims? I would not because, but even though it's kind of contradictory on myself, I still see that there are different religions mm -hmm. and I personally believe that it's the same God. I mm -hmm. personally believe that's the same God. There's different prophets. Okay. That bugs me when I hear that. And, and we were talking about earlier about like a defeat, a, a defeater for the outsider test for faith and uh, presuppositionalists might, might be one aspect of that. And then I think this, well, everyone's believing in the same God canard that I hear people saying, and it's really frustrating. I I'd really like to hear what somebody like a John Loftus might say to that response. I don't know if he's ever considered it or encountered it. What about you, Reed? I'm sure you must get that. I've, I've personally gotten it many times. Um, it, uh, I don't know, it makes sense to me on my model of what God is. It's just a set of ideas that allows people to social needs. So if it, if it's, okay. uh, it's just, a, it's just a, a thing that comfortable or make sense of things. So if, okay, you're if, not viewing it as an entity, you're viewing it as a, as a construct of a person's mind. Yeah. They're just using this idea this you know worldview axiom to meet their needs mm -hmm. was it the first time that you encountered that raul say it again was that the first time that you encountered somebody saying that uh everyone's just all believing in the same god um yeah i don't get that that as often um so it's, it's kind of hard to, to know where to, where to go with something like that yeah let's see what you did here but I just believe in the way of the Christian way because I do take world religions currently okay. and with world religions I have seen the uh, similarities between the both of the religions uh -huh. and even Judaism and I just believe from what I've seen from that it's just the different religions are just different ways of practicing uh, and praising the same Lord. Hmm. Okay. So you, so you, you wouldn't accept that as, as evidence for the truthfulness of his claims? I believe, like, I would say, oh, prayer does work, because I believe that prayer works. Mm -hmm. But with saying that Allah is the one, I believe that Allah could just be another name for God. And that, same with Yahweh, mm -hmm. for the Jews. It's just a different way to look at it. Okay. Then why do you identify as a Christian? What yeah, if you good. what if you met somebody who didn't believe any any of those gods, and they said um, that the reason I don't believe there is a God is because let's say the reverse of that reason, the reverse of the reason you gave. They said because I prayed and nothing happened, or I, my mom was in the hospital, she had surgery, I prayed, and her length of recovery was actually longer, or she never made it out of the, the operating room or something like that. Um, wow. Do you think that would serve as evidence of their claim that, that you know, no, no gods exist? I do not. I would not believe them because, like I said, even if a prayer does not particularly work, it's just God. He is at work constantly <clears throat> and he has millions of children, billions of children, and he has to focus on not only just you, but all the rest. Mm -hmm. And he is constantly trying to test your faith. So even if your prayers don't work, it's mm -hmm. just God testing you and seeing how strong you are and if you will deter from the faith. Okay. Is there anything concerning the, the prayer issue, the mir miracles like, like you described, is there anything at all that would that would convince you um, that these weren't from uh, the, a result of God acting? Is there anything that would convince you otherwise concerning your belief, and that would that would prove to you that th these these events weren't God af after all? Is there anything at all that would do that for you? No. I always 
I've always been taught that God is Almighty. Okay. Um. And you're saying you believe that because of the the miracles, because of the prayer. Yes. But if somebody gave that same reason, you wouldn't you wouldn't accept that as proof for their beliefs. Like like I said, in the case of an atheist. Uh, just because a prayer does not work because God is Almighty in a bunch of different ways. For example, like He, I've just always been taught that He loves us and He not only has. He not only does miracles, but he also gives us a good moral standpoint. Mm -hmm. Because without these, we wouldn't know what's morally correct, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Because then there could be like a bunch of people going around killing, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have like a good like backup for like, oh, why is killing bad? Mm -hmm. It's just that there's different things, and within atheists, it's not really. I just don't really believe them. Mm -hmm. Like okay. I'm gonna. I'll respect them, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to, like, believe them because everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Okay. Um, how is the evidence that you give for your belief of any better um, quality, let's say, than the evidence offered by, in this, in this example, in this scenario, the, the one who denies the existence of any gods? The, you're, you're appealing to the, your experience with prayer, and they likewise are appealing to their experience with prayer. In your case, it worked. In their case, it didn't. But you're both appealing to your experience with prayer. What so one question I wish I would have asked is when she talked about how, no, I'm going to believe, my, I'm going to hold my belief no matter what, in spite of any evidence, is to maybe have a discussion with her about, is it a virtue for somebody to alter their beliefs based on the evidence? Do you, would, would that be something that you would recommend people do or, or not and, and why? Yeah, when she started bringing up morality, I thought, oh, no, here we go. This is going to get really complicated really quick. Um, and I know a lot of time was spent on prayer, too. I, I would want to know if if she would still believe if every prayer that she made or any of her friends made or anyone in her entire life made didn't come true, if she'd still think that prayer was a reliable way to conclude that her God was real. Um it seemed like you tried to do like an outsider test for faith on the prayer thing uh, there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to, and, and I had to kind of switch to not, um, like a atheism, you know? So I, I started out with Islam, but then when she, you know, started talking about how, well, all, all religions are just the same. I had to, okay, well, forget the religious part. Let's talk about the non-religious person or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. How many more minutes are left on this one? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't see it. Pro okay. Probably not long. All right. About your experience that makes it any more valid, valid as evidence than their experience. Like I said, everyone is entitled to their own opinion and their own experiences, and they're allowed to believe what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm very open-minded and I respect them. Mm -hmm. But I'm just not going to believe what they say because it's just what I've seen and mm -hmm. what I'm not going to deter from my faith. Okay, so you're, so they have the right to believe what they want. Yes. And you're going to believe what, in, in your case, that Jesus is your savior. But how do we determine who, whose evidence to trust? If, if they're giving um, their experience with prayer as a reason why their belief is true, and you're giving your experience with prayer as a reason why your, your belief is true, how does the objective observer determine, how do we determine who to, whose evidence to accept as, as valid as 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 determining who's who's the who has the truth they should experience it for themselves personally mm -hmm. um because you just can't trust everyone nowadays because some of these people are sketchy mm -hmm. and you just can't be like oh yeah i'm gonna believe this person just because they said this you can't trust people's words Mm -hmm. You have to trust them through hard evidence, and I trust my hard evidence through what I've seen through my eyes. Okay, so you trust hard evidence. If there were hard evidence that indicated contrary to your beliefs, would you, would you accept that, theoretically, if it, it was, if it was hard, hard evidence? Well, I'm a logical person, mm -hmm. so I suppose I would, like, if someone, like, uh, let's say, Allah came down, and, or let's say... 
like a Greek god like Zeus, he came down, he's just like, y'all been wrong all along. I'd be like, well, shit, I guess you're right. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, okay. Okay. If someone gives me logical evidence and I can see it with my own eyes and they're like, hey, I'm actually Zeus or mm -hmm. something like that, then I'll believe them, but I'm not going to deter from my faith until proven true. Yeah. Okay. All right, Tyron, I appreciate it. You, you've been generous with your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot for the conversation. Nice. Nice talk. Thanks. Reed, I saw you smiling there. Yeah. I mean, just saying I'm a logical person after after all that. Uh, but, you know. Your firmware, you're uh, actually smiling now. It's good. It's a good improvement. Mm -hmm. well, I, have, I have a few things. Um, I think at the very beginning of the talk, when you're like kind of building rapport, you were talking like very, very fast. Um, but by the end, you're you slowed down a bit. So that was that was good. Beginning, talking fast, and like re kind of repeating yourself a little bit. It's probably just the nerves, you know. Um, that happens. Um, also, a couple of times you said, um, like, you could be wrong, or, or you mentioned wrong, word. And just in general, uh, I think mistaken works a little bit better. It's a little, little softer. Avoid saying like prove because that may that might imply like to absolute certainty. Um, I noticed you didn't use a scale. Say you know raise or lower your confidence based on the scale. Um, but yeah, but very very good overall. I like the discussion. I think the most at the end there when she was talking about hard evidence and that you can't trust what people say, but it seemed like the main reason why she was so sure that what she's believing is true is because what other people are saying, the miracles that they're reporting, the the prayers that, that are being reported to her that are being answered. And um, yeah, I guess maybe a discussion about what what constitutes hard evidence. And perhaps like that Ferrari example would be useful or the the, the Lamborghini example um, that we've kind of been banding about. I don't know if you've seen it or not, Ra Raul, but where we just take a real world example. And what would you what would you accept? If I were to make a claim right now, would you trust me because I just told you that? Or would you would you need some evidence and what would constitute hard evidence? So maybe just a a, a larger discussion about evidence and and uh, what a person would accept could be useful with, with somebody like that, but it was respectful. It was calm. Nobody was raising their voices. You weren't causing a scene on the campus, which is always good. And uh, people were walking by, um, maybe in terms of what was going on there. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering also if, um, you know, I, th I think if you keep doing what you're doing in the similar spot, you're going to probably have secondary encounters. And I don't know if you've even had any of those yet, but um, you might want to get prepared for something like that. It's probably coming. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the feedback. And you're more than welcome to stick around too. We're going to probably shift here very soon to a different topic. Rita, okay. Let you go with that. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Raul, for, for doing that. And uh, for... so next up, we're going to be talking about avoiding facts. Do does SE avoid facts? Are we? Do we not care about facts? Chided so Sam and Raul, feel free to jump here, jump in here on this. Um, this is a common thing that yeah. I've seen, where apologists for for years now have latched on to this this line from Bogosian's book, something along the lines of avoid facts when you're conversing with somebody about a deeply held belief, and they take that to mean avoid evidence, and that's not at all what what Bogosian I think is saying. Um, I even messaged him. Damn it, I should have had that. Um, but he was essentially saying, no, this is when, when he's referring to avoiding facts, he's, he's meaning don't get wrapped up in a conversation about uh, what somebody's purporting to be evidence and a reason for them holding the belief when it really isn't. Yes, of course, if that is the reason why they believe it and, it, and they think that that's evidence, then go with that. But when it comes to a supernatural belief like a God or a karma, most people are not basing those beliefs on facts or evidence. They're basing it on something else like an emotional need or faith 
um, something along those lines. But I keep seeing this time and time again, and I don't know, I don't understand why, why um, people keep fixating on that and misrepresenting it. I don't know if you guys have any theories or thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, my response to somebody saying that we're avoiding facts is to say, no, we're not avoiding facts, but we want to go deeper than the facts. And so, yeah, let's start with facts. Let's start with the, the claims. But then let's go deeper than the claims themselves and discuss how you establish those claims. Yeah, and the common thing that um, street epistemologists will do is ask about whether or not the person's confidence will change if it turned out that they were mistaken about the evidence. And we do commonly find that the person will say no that their confidence won't change. And when you get into that position, that is part of the reason why I think Boghossian um, put that line in there. You know, when the facts aren't really why the person believes, discussion about them isn't going to be fruitful. Right. So perhaps from this point forward, when, when individuals encounter people who are saying that street epistemologists don't care about facts, link them to this section of this video so that they can hear this 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 discussion here because um i see it again and again and i'm i'm not sure if it's an intentional misrepresentation or they're just not understanding that if you have facts and your belief is based on facts we will examine those facts with you if that really is the reason why you believe what you believe but it doesn't seem to be the case many of these beliefs are not based on evidence they're not based on facts they're based on faith. Exactly. Yeah, I, I want to proportion my confidence to the evidence. And if I found some type of evidence that I was using to believe something is not, not reliable or not true, then I would want to lower my confidence about whatever I'm believing. I come across someone who says that that if they have a piece of evidence that would not, you know, uh, lower their confidence if found to be unreliable, then I should pitch, like, try to peel back, as you say, like go up the chain of, to figure out what, instead of like, you know, piling on, as you say, Anthony. Yeah, I think it could be a little, a, a little surprising for somebody who's using SE and you encounter an individual who says, you know what, yeah, if that fact uh, could be shown to my satisfaction that it wasn't reliable, then I would lower my confidence. A lot of people who are using SE then don't know where to go with that. So maybe that's part of this. Like maybe maybe they see the hesitation on the person who's doing SE of not wearing to not knowing where to go, and then they take that as an interpretation of that. Oh man, they don't care about facts. But no, um, if somebody mm -hmm. does say, yeah, if if it could be shown to me that evolution is real, then I would significantly lower my confidence that Jesus exists. If they really mean that, yeah. engage with them in, you have to start you know, going down the rabbit hole of, of teaching them about evolution or point them to, them to resources. Um, but it's rare when somebody does say that, yeah, uh, my, my belief really is evidence-based and I would lower my confidence. Yeah. So another component of it, and Reed, I think you can probably talk to this more than I can, but... Um, Bringing up contradictory information can actually have like a negative um, psychological effect that goes against the purposes of having the conversation. Um, and the, there is some literature on this and evidence of what they call the backfire effect. And yeah. Yeah. I think everyone has this experience of like, arguing with people the, like the normal way it's like well okay you believe something oh wait i i don't believe that i have evidence against that evidence and you, you'll just change your mind because you know i have this evidence when people do that and they see that it doesn't work by avoiding facts like if if the facts if of giving facts to someone doesn't work then we need some different method to be able to talk about what's true Using street epistemology, like talking about how we arrive at beliefs, is one way to get around that psychological, like, uh, that's going on, just trying to lower the defenses of people. We don't have to talk about 
you know, people being being wrong, both can figure out what's true. And if whatever ways we're doing or using to come to beliefs, if those if those ways are reliable. You know, and we we try to advise people to focus on the how related questions and not so much on the what and the why. And when you think about it, the what is probably the fact in in the person's mind who holds the belief. So perhaps the, the, they're, they're noticing this reluctance to to talk about what the person believes, and then they view that as us wanting to avoid facts, avoid evidence. But again, if it's not the reason why the person is believing, then we have no interest in it. Why would I want to spend any time testing how reliable, I don't know, miracles are if you would still believe in the God if you've never experienced a miracle? So, so this is about efficiency, and it's not about avoidance. All right, well, anything else about see, avoiding facts? I don't have any more thing more to add. Do you, Raul? I can I can kind of see what you're talking about, Anthony, when you when um you say that possibly people are seeing should a certain street epistemologists like hesitant to go into facts because I've had ex an experience recently where like most of the people I run into on campus, they they appeal to such relativistic reasons like faith and stuff like that. And those are easy conversations to have because the foundation is so poor and easy to kind of bring out. But I, I ran into um, some uh, some street uh, evangelists on campus recently from a campus ministry. And this one guy, he was an older gentleman. I started talking to him. Um, we started out with me probing the limits of his, what would change his mind and so forth. And like, it turned out this guy was actually pretty open-minded. And if the evidence were in place at every turn, he was like, yeah, I would, I would totally change my mind. And that's, that's when the difficulty comes in. Cause then you have to actually get into their more of their reasoning and their, the how behind their, you know, their knowledge claims. But even before that though, you have to make sure that they are, will follow through with what they've just told you. And that's why I think this confidence scale is as maligned as it can be. And as optional as it is, I do think it's useful because you can say, you know, you told me that you were hundred percent sure that this is true. We've identified this reason why you think it's true. What impact would would that have if you if we worked together and discovered that this wasn't reliable? Where would you move from the one hundred? You, you you know, if it's if it's if it's a reason, then I would think that there would be some response. And and that's when you, you can have them start to think like, hey, this would drop me down, you know, to a very low degree of confidence if I discovered again like that evolution was actually true. And then you have some buy-in. Not only are they confirming what they would accept, they are telling you how much of an impact that that would have on their confidence. And only then would I then, you know, shift to, all right, let's have the conversation. You know, tell me now what you would accept to discover that evolution was true. So it's always about questions, but it's it's kind of like testing the ice. You know, before you just you rush out into the middle of the pond. You want to test the edges first to make sure that you you can keep going out there with them. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, let's uh, move on to listener questions. Um, Cam, I think you might want to take this one. Someone mentioned, "Why do SE people always want to take the conversation to empiricism?" What's so great about empiricism. Ah, we should start with a definition first. Yeah. Um, yeah. So empiricism. Um, is a, a philosophical position in epistemology that uh, focuses on uh, evidence and the, in particular, um, uh, ways of um, confirming and disconfirming um, beliefs or hypotheses using evidence. And fundamentally how um, beliefs derive from evidence. Uh, why do SES tend to take um, things in that direction? I, I think it, owe, it, it um, owes to the fact that science has been so successful and um, science, science broadly does use empiricism. I mean, there are other methods involved with science too um, from epistemology, but it has been so successful um, making predictions um, and then 
finding out whether or not uh, your model actually matched the data is a uh, critical part of science and it's what aids us in both um, you know tentatively accepting or rejecting um, claims about the world and it's got a good track record and I think it's it's natural for us to focus what our, on what our um, strongest methods are. Now the difficulty comes in where um, there are a lot of beliefs I think we hold as humans that um, you know just don't meet that kind of rigorous scientific standard. Yet we still feel they're justified beliefs. Now these might be um, you know that my daughter is named. Um, what her name is, <laughs> um, or that um, one year ago I um, went ice skating, um, or, or something like that. And, you know, we don't really think of these things as having the rig rigorous scientific evidence that we do for um, evolution or uh, other such things. And I think um, people want I think that there's this fear that um, by focusing on empiricism that we are somehow like denigrating or um, getting rid of these, you know, common ways that are actually reliable for determining that certain things are true. Yeah, it seems kind of a, almost a pragmatic approach to me. It's like I'm part of reality and like, the physical things can harm me and i there's a lot more reality than me so if we can kind of figure out this reality thing i might be able to navigate my way through it a little bit better and safer and maybe like make the the world better and safer for people i care about so like abstract concepts or just any no like attachment to reality seems like it's like it's like i want to test my beliefs based on reality because that seems like my first impact point to like living in life. That's that's when I think about it. Yeah, I think that um, outside of empiricism and evidentialism, there is this uh, difficulty that it's harder to tell what things are true and what things are false, um, and that do in my perspective, that doesn't mean. Um, we should only stick to empiricism, but you know that's a different conversation. On to the next question: Are precepts even worth engaging, or is it a lost cause? I think Raul, I'll you think you have a perspective on this. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, it's I think it's helpful for them to have their own method used on them because. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier, maybe it was you, Cam, that they're really good at asking questions, um, but I found that they're not really good at answering questions. And so it's helpful for them to be on the other side of that and to experience, hey, let's let's have you defend some of your presuppositions as well. I tend to think that the person using the presuppositional argument is probably in the last vestiges of holding the belief, because in my view, it's such a weak argument. So as frustrating as it can be, I do think that if you have the if you have the patience and the time and you're willing to invest that into a person and preferably these are one on one face to face conversations or over Skype, um, I would try to. Yeah, I think I would put some effort towards it. Uh, uh, the thing, though, is that it's going to take a lot of time and you might be you might have 10 productive conversations with you know, completely different individuals as you would in the same amount of time as one precept. But um, yeah, I think everyone's kind of wor worth having a conversation with if you if you can dedicate yourself to it. Great. Okay. Um, let's do something. Uh, what is your reaction to the Apologetics Academy Facebook page or group um, referring to some admins kicking some street epistemologists out? I just joined that group this morning, so I really can't comment too much on it other than I think uh, somebody was making a post in the group that they noticed um, when they made a when they made a post asking about a person's confidence, administrators or possibly members were noticing 
the fingerprints of a street epistemology based conversation and either deleted them, deleted the post or admonished the member or booted them completely from the group. I'm not exactly sure on what happened. Um, so there seems to be some sort of visceral reaction or you know, somebody not wanting to have that type of dialogue in that group, which is the group's right. Um, but it being an apologist group, you would think that they would want to have the conversation. I'm not exactly sure. Oh, I think the argument was that um, SE is for unprepared believers and we're prepared believers. So it's not, it's not the place for it. We recognize the approach and, and you're, you're not welcome here with that. Um, that's about all I know right now. Um, I, I would give a shout out to, I think I know which group you're talking about, um, but they do have a, um, a live stream slash webinar thing that they do each week. And they have some really good guests on there, like Reed. Um, and <laughs> and I, I really commend them for having open dialogue and um, I, I appreciate them. And I think, at the heart of it, the main people involved in it, like Jonathan McClatchy, um, they are evidentialists and they do care about evidence. Um, you and I might think that they are mistaken about it, but um, but yeah, I I think that they're a great bunch of people. Yeah, always always a pleasure to talk with someone who values evidence. Yeah, so. Next up, uh, how tempted are you to try and establish a person's attitude towards truth from the beginning? What do you think, Anthony? I'm nearly always these days tempted to to address it. I look I look for words. I look for behaviors. Um, I look the belief itself might remind me a little bit more than another belief. So if somebody says that they believe in Reiki healing. I might be more reminded to do the truth test at the start than if they said they want to discuss how um, GMOs are safe. So I have some own, my own biases, I think, in when I decide to roll out the truth test, but it's probably something that we should do for everybody regardless, because you might be surprised at how people are viewing that. Yeah. Um, Anthony, you uploaded this like quick clip from someone like saying you're you wanted to ask if you're like a serial killer and there's a question about like your approach sounds creepy and canned uh let's mm -hmm. discuss his complaint and possible solutions yeah okay so the creepy and canned comment has been um somebody mentioned that a couple weeks ago and we, we've just not gotten around to answering it um i mean i try not to be creepy i don't know what i can do to be less <laughs> creepy i mean i am out in the woods with a camera or an old guy on a college campus um, so I try to look as approachable as possible. I try to be polite as possible. Um, I don't know what more I can do to try to to try to bridge that gap. Yeah. Um, I'm not Especially sure. having my yeah, I I am under no disillusion that what I'm doing is weird. <laughs> it's not normal. Like having a table with a bunch of cameras and microphones. In a, yeah, in a I even park. said like I have a uh, I have an unusual hobby. And I ask questions and do these things. Um, yeah, I'm trying to come across as as normal as possible. But the other thing too is um, the canned comment. I wrote a post on I think it's called pitching the script, where I talk about the pros and cons of boiling down your conversations to the point where they seem very canned. Um, that is probably the negative that observers look at it and see, oh, you're being insincere. But somebody new to street epistemology might be more apt to pick it up and use it when they hear a claim if they become comfortable with the typical flow of the conversations. So I'm a little torn. Like, yeah, you want to be sincere. You want to be original. You want to put your own spin on it like Raul does. And like you do, Reed. You know, like, and the other, the other examples that I'm seeing out there, there there's all these little, little twists that make them just a little bit unique, which is great. Um, and then uh, it's nice also to make it easy enough, uh, homogenized to the point where people can pick it up pretty quickly and start using it and not on the street. You could just, you know, let it happen. Yeah, cool. Let's do, let's make this the last question. Um, a while back, someone in the SE group channel where people could submit unedited content, is that still being considered? 
I don't know if we want to put unedited content on a YouTube channel, but maybe like some Dropbox folder or some. Oh, I know what, some I know what they're referring to. Cool. Yeah, so there is a little bit of a, a discussion going on right now of creating a way for people who don't want to go through the time of building a YouTube channel, but they're okay going out and having a talk and recording it and maybe, I don't know, 10 conversations a year or even one conversation a year. And if they had a way to, to um, distribute their discussion without having to build up a YouTube channel, they would submit content. So yeah, it is one of the things that's on our radar. Um, we have a few bigger fish to fry right now. We've got the logo going on and um, a discussion about trying to put some formal structure around SE. So once we get that in place, I think probably in 2018, there, there's gonna probably be some movement of having um, a way to distribute individuals content individuals videos of their talks and uh in you know letting people see different styles letting people see what what does what does an se conversation look like in australia how about puerto rico you know um so i think this could be a really good way of getting the word out but we're not quite there yet but it hasn't fallen off of our radar cool yeah i'd love to see that so stay tuned i guess all right so all right, let's wrap up. Any uh, announcements? Um, I think, yeah, Anthony, you want to give an update on the logo? The only thing with the logo is that we've selected it, and right around the first of the year, you'll start seeing it propagate through all the social media sites and uh, as a little watermark probably on videos like this. Um, we're not announcing it just yet. We're gonna, we want to wait. We want to kind of do a big rollout. You'll, you'll, you'll notice it on all the social media platforms if you're following any of those on on, uh, um, on this Facebook or YouTube or whatever. Cool. Do you have any upcoming talks at all, Anthony? The only big talk coming up is is I'm going to Oslo, Norway in January. And nice. that's pretty much all I have. I'm hoping to do a couple of workshops at some upcoming conferences. But I haven't heard anything official yet. So as soon as I hear something, then I'll be talking about that. Sweet. How about um, you, Reed? Are you going to be giving any talks soon? Um, I haven't really been asked. asked. I don't. I don't know about that. I. I. Uh, I could try. I'd like to. I don't know. We'll see about that. If someone wants me to do a talk anywhere, I'd be glad to do it. So yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Cam, want to give any like uh, closing thoughts for social media? Where, pe where can people find you? Yeah, sure. So I have a project I'm working on. Um, haven't really released a lot of content yet, but um, it's more of a counter apologetics or history thing uh, called Gospel Fictions. I have a Twitter account um, at Gospel Fictions and a, um, a Facebook page as well, Gospel Fictions again. And I have a website which I'm ramping up and writing content for at the moment, which uh, presents a, an argument about the Gospels. Um, and I also have uh, my personal Facebook account, which, you know, feel free to add me if you're interested or follow me there. And yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool. Uh, how about you, Raul? Yep. The uh, main place where people can find me is just on YouTube. My YouTube channel's name is Street Knowledge. And uh, I try to post a video at least every couple of weeks. And um, I'm also on Facebook as well. Yeah, everybody give Raul a follow, please. Mm -hmm. Give me yeah. some feedback too on his videos. I find that that was a really good way to to improve too. Thank you, and Anthony for yourself. I'm sure people know, but just to yeah, just go to. Whoops, I just muted myself. Um, go to my YouTube channel, which is Magna Bosco two ten, or follow me on Twitter, Magna Bosco. Yep, and again, I'm Reed Nice Wonder. I've got YouTube channel Cordial Curiosity. Also, social media, just search Cultural Curiosity. It was a very, very nice show. Thanks again, guys, for joining. Um, can't wait till uh, next time. So, all right. Thanks, everybody.